Hello friends, this is Miss Ella, your teacher for harmony at home. I hope you had a nice and musical week. Our last two classes were about Baroque music. You learned the important facts about the Baroque period in music history. You got to see and hear an instrument popular in the Baroque period. And you discovered the composer Bach and his wonderful concerto for two violins and orchestra. Today we will begin learning about the instruments that make up an orchestra. We will begin by exploring the string family. You saw and heard the violin last week, but today you are going to meet a real violin player, a real artist. But first, let's start with our game. The game is still the double echo. You already know how it works, since this is our third week playing this game. Don't forget, you need to concentrate on the new rhythm while you're doing the one I just did. Are you ready? Let's start. Did it work? Did you do it correctly? If you didn't, don't worry. You will have the chance next time to get it right. The instruments that make up an orchestra are divided into four different groups and they sit in a half circle. The string family sits in the front. You can see them in the red color. Behind them sits the woodwind family. You can see them in the yellow color. Behind the woodwind instruments, you can see the brass in green. And behind the brass sit the percussion instruments, here in purple. Every family includes different instruments and we will have a different lesson for each family. Today we will take a look at the string family. On the left side, you can see the violins, divided into two groups, first violin and second violin. The first violin players play the same part, and normally the second violin players play a different part. Next to the second violin, you can see the viola. It might seem identical to the violin, but it's a bigger instrument. We will hear an example of those two playing together in a few minutes. Next to the viola, you can see the cello, and behind the cello, you can see the double bass, which looks like a bigger cello. Which instrument would play the higher notes, the violin or the double bass? Listen carefully, I'm sure you will know the answer after listening to this short example.
the double bass can go lower, since it's a bigger instrument. All these instruments have four strings, and that's the reason we call this family the strings. All these instruments are played with a bow. Moving the bow on the string makes the string vibrate and the sound can be heard. Here you can see the bow making the string vibrate in a very slow motion. When it's at normal speed, you cannot notice it as clearly as you can right now. This same system works for all string instruments. The string players can also play without a bow, with the help of their fingers. We call this technique pizzicato, again a word in Italian that means to pinch. Sometimes the composer writes pizzicato for all the strings in the orchestra. Let's hear a beautiful example of this technique played by the whole orchestra. Let's move on and try to see the difference between a violin and a viola. You can see the violin on the left side and the viola on the right side. The violin is smaller and you will hear that it plays higher notes, while the viola is bigger and plays lower notes. Their big brother is the cello. The cello can play even lower notes than the viola, since it's a bigger instrument. cello with its warm sound. I can listen to it for hours. The biggest instrument in this family is the double bass. It is so big that many times people play it standing up. Let's listen to some notes from a concerto for double bass. Do you remember what a concerto is? A musician playing his or her instrument stands in front of the orchestra and plays the solo part, while the orchestra is playing the accompaniment, the tutti part.
instrument, right? Now I think it's time to meet our guest for today, Joshua Bell. Mr. Bell is one of the most famous violin players in the world. He has performed as a soloist with many of the world's major orchestras, and he has performed with young musicians too. Before we meet him, let's hear him play a little bit. Here he is playing with some young musicians of the National Youth Orchestra of the United States. they make together. I bet Josh has a lot to teach us. Would you like to meet him? Let's say hello. Hello Josh, I'm so excited to have you here with Harmony at Home for our lesson about the string family of instruments. Hi Josh. Hello, how are you? Good to be Fine. here. Fine, thank you. Thank you for being here. So I have with me today two of our students. They are both violin players. Janie, from Canarsie in Brooklyn. Hi, Janie. And Aiden from Chinatown. Hi, Aiden. So we were already talking uh, a little today about the string instruments. And my students ha here have some questions for you about the violin and about your musical experience. But maybe I can ask the first question. Um, many of the students listening to us today have never played the violin. Can you tell us about the instrument and its different parts, please? Ah, well, I may be biased because I've been a violinist all my life, but I think the violin is the most, uh, I don't know, the most like the human voice of any instrument. I think all string instruments are kind of like the human voice, which is why we, I think why we all love stringed instruments because uh, they, they, you can really sing on, on a violin. Of course, my pianist friends will argue with me, well, you can sing on a piano and make a beautiful sound, but, uh, but there's nothing like the sound of a violin. The violin can do anything a voice can, but it has a range that's even much more. Here, I have my violin with me here. It goes all the way down to the lowest note of the G string. Uh, sometimes I'm jealous of the cello players because they can go much lower, but we can go all the way up to I mean, that's a huge range. There's so, so much you can do with that, that range. And you can make so many kinds of sounds. You, know, so you can make beautiful, rich sounds like Do you notice the, how I was sliding between notes? And that's like a human voice. Um, you cannot do that on the piano. You can go from one note to the next, but you can't do that. And and you can, on the violin can do with the with the bow. You can do so many great things with the bow. You can do fast um, uh, spiccato. Or you can do a ricochet, which is like bouncing. Um, sitting down is hard to play, but, <laughs> but um, there's so many tricks and fun things you can do on the violin. So, so you have a lot of tools to, to make music with on the violin. And um, of course, as you violinists know, it has four strings. Um, and uh, this particular violin we could talk about maybe later, but um, this is a very special violin made by Stradivarius. It's 
more than 300 years old and it's worth millions of dollars, but that's a whole other, other story. <laughs> what a beautiful sound it has. Amazing. Thank you so much for Thanks. playing uh, Frank for us. Um, Janie, do you have a question for our guest today? My name is Janie and I am 10 years old. I started to play the violin when I was seven. How old were you when you started to play the violin? I was actually just about to turn five years old. Uh, so I was still four and my parents gave me a violin. Um, my, my dad always wished he played the violin, but he started when he was in his thirties or something like that. So he, should, he always wished, why didn't I start to play when I was a kid? And so when he finally had a kid, which was me, he said, um, we're going to start him early because uh, uh, it's so great to have music, you know, from an early age. So that's how I started. I started when I was just uh, four years old, and I feel really lucky that my parents started me on, on, on the violin. Aiden, do you want to ask your question, please? Yes, I have a question. Hi, Mr. Bell. My name is Aiden, and I'm also 10 years old. My teacher is named Miss Maria. She helps us play our violin better. I would like to know if you had a favorite teacher and why. Ah, good question. Having a good teacher and someone that you like is, as a teacher is really important. Teachers, like, after parents, teachers are the next most important things as far as making you grow up to be a better person or, in, a, in this case, a better violinist. By the way, 10 years old, you guys are so lucky. It's, that was my favorite year when I was 10. My fifth grade, are you fourth grade or fifth grade? Fifth grade? Five. That was my favorite year. I loved it. I had really three major teachers in my life. The first I had when I was four years old, and she was a wonderful old lady in my town um, in Bloomington, Indiana. And she, she made me really love the violin at first. She was, um, uh, she just was a very loving person um, and loved music. So she made me, got me started, um, and I really loved that. And I'm very grateful to her. But then after about four years, my parents realized that I needed a teacher that would, that would be, give me a little more structure and tell me how and that, because I was doing a lot of bad habits. I was holding the bow a little bit kind of like this instead of like this. And, and so we, we went to another teacher named Mimi Zweig. And she's a very well-known teacher now. And she had a very strong method and she, how to hold the violin. And she, she made me do lots of scales and etudes and things. And so I fixed a lot of those problems. And then when I was 12, she realized, she said, you know, you need to go to the next level. And so she found the teacher that I went to that became like my grandfather. His name was Joseph Gingold. And he was a really, really famous teacher, um, and very old. And he then took me to the next level um, and prepared me to be, to be a concert violinist. So I had several teachers and um, they're very, very special to me. My old teacher, Gingold, he died many, many years ago because he was very old when I was 12. But, um, but I still have a picture of him on my wall. And when I practice, and he, so he's looking down at me and, and uh, smiling at me when I practice. So I'm very grateful to my teachers. Good question. Good answer. <laughs> um, Jamie, you have, uh, I think you have a question about playing in front of other people? How does it feel to play in front of thousands of people? Do you ever get nervous? Oh God, of course, yeah. I get, do you get nervous when you play in class for people? Yeah. I've never met anybody who said no, actually, to that question, because we, we all get nervous. Um, and that's a good thing, um, to a degree. Of course, you don't want to be so nervous that you start playing your piece and you go, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, which, which is basically the nerves. When you have nerves, it's like, you know what that comes from? It comes from adrenaline, which is in your body already, but your, your body sends, gives you adrenaline, and, which is, can help you if you're like running away from something. It gives you extra energy, but that extra energy translates into like 10 cups of coffee. You know? so, so there are ways to combat that. Um, and I do get nervous uh, every time. So there are several ways to, to help that. Uh, one, of course, the number one is just preparing well, you know, just I'm most nervous when I don't feel prepared. So if I didn't practice enough, then I'm more nervous. If, if I, uh, so, the, so what can help there is also if you're going to play in class and you have, or a recital or something, 
the night before, play for your parents and your, if you have brothers and sisters, have them sit down on the couch and say, I'm gonna play through my piece. And, and, and maybe do it a couple of times. Because then when you do it the next day in your concert, you know you've done it. You played from beginning to end. Because everything is always scarier the first time. Have you ever been on a ride, like a roller coaster or anything like that? What's scarier, the first time you're on it or the second time you're on it? The first time. Absolutely. It's always the first time you do something is scary. The first time you jump out of an airplane, well, okay, I've never done that yet. <laughs> and never will. But I'm sure the first time is, is really, really much scarier than the second. So it's the same with your piece. Um, and a new piece is always scarier than a piece I've done before. So that's really important. Then you can also, also for me, another phenomenon, as you might say, what happens when you play a concert and you're nervous, guess what happens? Does, does your playing get faster or slower? Um, faster? Yeah, it usually gets faster. So if you're used to doing something, then you suddenly get nervous. And you start rushing, right? So, um, so it's really good to practice a little bit slow. So everything you, every, everything you do, just practice everything a little bit slower than you normally do so that you can really master it. Um, and then, and that, that way you're comfortable playing slow because then when you're nervous, um, you know how to slow yourself down because your, your, your body knows how to play slower as well. So that's, um, that's really important. So that's, that sometimes I also take deep breaths before I play. I really deep breaths and that just calms me down before I go out on stage. And then there are lots of other things. I think about why am I nervous? Why am I really nervous? Everybody's on my side. It's just usually, you know, in, if you're playing in class, you're usually playing for other kids uh, and, and their parents, and they're all on your side. They all want you to do well. They're not wishing you badly. And, and um, uh, so you know, I try to think that everybody's on my side and they all wish, wish me well. And, and uh, that, that helps me um, a little bit too. Wow, so many tips and so many things, interesting things. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, okay, um, Aiden and, and Jamie, do you have any other questions you would like to ask? Yeah, I have another question. I try to play every day. How much do you practice? Oh, well, I try to play every day also. Um, when I was your age, I tried to practice an hour a day. So if you, I, um, if you can, you know, obviously the more you practice, the better you're gonna get. So nowadays I try to practice anywhere from two to four hours every day, but it's my job. You know, I don't have school like you do, you know, for six, seven hours a day. Um, so this is really my job. And I don't have to go to an office like most people go for eight or nine hours a day. This is my job and it's a really lucky job because it's what I love to do and I get, make a living from it. So it's, uh, I feel like one of the luckiest people, but I do have to work and I do pr try to practice like two to four hours every day. Thank you. Jamie, do you have one last question that you want to ask? Yes. Sometimes it's hard to play in tune. Can you give me advice to, on how to play in tune? As far as playing in tune, you know what the most important organ of your body is for playing in tune? Can you guess? Yes. <laughs> your ears. Yes. <laughs> because playing in tune requires listening and knowing when you're playing out of tune. And that's the most important thing that you know. Uh, if you don't know you're playing out of tune, uh, have you ever tried to sing a song or, or seen someone try to sing a song when they've got headphones on because they can't hear what they're actually singing? And it sounds awful because they don't hear what they're singing. And so, ah, 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 you know, so it's because they're not listening. So when you're playing, you have to be constantly listening for being in tune. So when it's out of tune, it starts vibrating in a funny way. You know, but when it's in tune, everything's like the world is aligned. So you have to keep listening for that. Not quite. There we go. I want to thank Jenny, Jenny and Aiden for um, your great questions. And of course, thank you so much, Josh, for being with us today. Uh, we have learned a lot about the violin and I'm thrilled that my students got the chance to meet you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jenny and, and Aiden. You guys, I can tell you guys are really smart and really 
uh, I'll bet you're really good, good violinists and good musicians, and you will be even better as you get older. And I can't wait to hear you play someday. So thanks for your great questions. And really, really nice to meet you all. Thank you. Bye, everyone. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you. That was a wonderful conversation. He had so much helpful information to share, and I'm so happy you got the chance to meet him in person. You learned today many new things about the string family. Do you remember which instrument can play the highest notes and which one can play the lowest notes? Let's try to classify these instruments from the highest to the lowest. Take a look for a second. What are their names? How can we classify them? The violin would be the first one, the highest one. Then the viola, followed by the cello, and the double bass. What do they all have in common? They all have four strings, and we play them with a bow or by pinching the strings, playing pizzicato. The next family we will explore in a few lessons will be the woodwind family, the one sitting just behind the string family in the orchestra. In the meantime, I encourage you and your family to watch and listen to a wonderful piece of music written 75 years ago by an English composer named Benjamin Britten. The name of the piece is The Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra. Together, you can try to identify the different families of instruments that play within the orchestra. You can find this piece on YouTube. The music is beautiful and I'm sure you will enjoy it. I will see you next week for a special lesson about what it's like to play in an orchestra. Until then, make it a musical week. <laughs>